this function. And the thing says uh, returning 109.89. Okay, so $109.89. And the thing just started spitting quarters, quarters and quarters and quarters. Mm -hmm. But it only had like $25 worth of quarters in it. And like other change, like I got two dollar coins and then a bunch of pennies and other stuff. So it just rejected all the exchange fees. <laughs> right, when I put one dollar in. <laughs> you know, it's the weirdest thing when you're calling the number that's on the side of the support, like, hey, um, I know for a fact that I put one dollar in this machine because I don't carry around a hundred dollar bills. Um, I'm pretty sure that there was an error and I'd like to not steal this money. So can you like bring somebody out to yeah. fix the machine and collect the money. And I was in contact with these people who were like, hey, the technician never paid. Oh. You have a machine with a consistent issue of <laughs> spitting all this change out on somebody. Uh, I guess they're enjoying the weather outside or something. It is. Maybe they're sitting uh, outside in their porches in, in Zoom. Wow, that's not good. I was hoping maybe to go to Nashville if the weather is good. Okay, friends, we're about to start. Can you hear me in Zoom? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, friends, welcome back. For some reason, we don't have a huge attendance here in the lab. I guess uh, people are, are using their time wisely, enjoying the weather or something. So well, welcome back. Uh, today's uh, formal part, the lecture will not be that long. We will talk about creating ERD models in general. How do you approach uh, the task of discovering or creating uh, entities and, and uh, putting those entities in an ERD diagram? Uh, it, you know, this topic has a, has a practical overlap with your assignment three, because as I showed you last week, as a part of assignment three, you'll have to create an ERD diagram for your local library based on the case supplied with, with assignment three. So we'll talk about this topic. We'll talk about entity discovery, okay? After that, I will make some announcements. Um, next week will be different because it will be more of a self-study week. There are a couple of things that you need to do during that week. Uh, you have to take the exam one, uh, then you also have to complete Microsoft Access tutorial because after next week we'll get with, uh, we'll get into hands-on exercises where or assignments where we actually build Microsoft Access databases, and I want to make sure that everybody is up to speed with Microsoft Access uh, application. Okay, I'll tell you like the ideas that I have for next week, like how I see it, and please uh, uh, please be honest. Tell me if something doesn't make sense to you, right? I normally don't do it that way. Like for example, I ask students to come to class to take the exam, but I will, I will do it outside of the class this time again, because of COVID. I, I, my approach right now is that if I, don't have to, if I don't have to ask people to come in, then I don't, right? Because, uh, hopefully it will decrease the chances of them contracting the virus. And hopefully it will also put the power into their hands when it comes to organizing their own time. Because nowadays people are doing all kinds of things because again, COVID changed all the rules, all the schedules for us. So that's the, that's the agenda for today. Anything else that we need to discuss before we start? What about you guys in Zoom? Any comments, questions so far? Not yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, so 
first we will talk about creating ERD models. What are the generic steps that you need or phases that you need to go through to create an ERD model? Again, this topic has, uh, has, that practical, has practical relevance for your assignment three where you have to create an ERD model for your local library. So uh, those are the steps that people typically go through. Uh, I think somebody needs to stand up and walk around because it has some kind of motion detector. Thank you. So yeah, if you have to, so when people, create, when systems analysts or business analysts, when they work uh, for organizations, when they have this task of, for creating a data model that will be further implemented by database designers, they typically follow the following uh, steps or phases listed here on the slide. First of all, uh, they start with, with context data model. Wait one second, let me check something. They start with context data model. Uh, that includes uh, entities and relationships without any details. So they just put those boxes on the screen on their diagram and they think about relationships and cardinalities without thinking about any details, right? So this is like a sketch of an ERD diagram. As a second step, what they do, they create a key-based data model. So once they have a sketch of their ERD diagram involving those boxes, uh, th those uh, uh, rectangles with rounded corners and those lines, that depict relationships, once they figure out cardinalities, they start adding primary and, formal, uh, and, and foreign keys, okay? So this is the step where you also, uh, where you can also uh, fine tune your cardinalities, right? Because once you have uh, primary keys inserted, you can think about one to many, zero to many relationships. You'll think about parent child rules and things like that. Uh, after that, you create a full attributed data model. So once you have your boxes, your, your relationships with cardinalities, you add all the relevant attributes to all the entities that you have on your ERD diagram. And after that, you normalize your model. So you go through normal forms one, two, and three, as we discussed last time, to make sure your model is good, right? It's, it's simple, it's non-redundant, non and also flexible and adaptable to future needs. And throughout the process, you, you can capture metadata. For example, you may have a dictionary where you, you keep track uh, of entities that you're creating, you're describing those entities, you also keep uh, track of attributes, their data types, what those attributes are storing. And that's something that you will have to do as a part of step one, right? Remember I asked you to create a table for each entity. So this is like your metadata about your ERD model. And I told you when I look at your ERD diagram, when I look at your submission, if I don't understand something about a particular entity or an attribute, I will go back to that part one, which contains your dictionary, right? Where I can quickly look up what you mean by a particular entity and what you mean by a particular attribute, okay? So, so that's exactly uh, that's exactly your assignment three. Now, a few comments on entity discovery. So we kind of started with this assumption that you already know what those entities are, okay? But how do you figure out what kind of entities you need to have on your ERD diagram? Well, those are some ways, uh, uh, some ways that uh, or, or methods that systems analysts use to discover entities that they need on the ERD diagram or, or the tables that they will eventually need in their database. The most, I think the most common approach is interviews. You just talk to people about their work, about their data needs, and throughout those interviews, you take notes, and then based on, uh, you know, then you analyze those notes, and in those notes, you look for certain nouns. Like, for example, if somebody says, we need to store information about uh, library patterns and their library cards, right? So you can underline those nouns, patrons, cards, which means that you have an entity for patrons to keep track of library members, and also you need to have an entity to keep track of cards, the library cards, cards that you're issuing to patrons, okay? Uh, so, so this is a basic interview. By the way, the notes that you have for assignment three, remember that file, that PDF that I gave you that comes from your textbook, right? It looks like a series of notes that the systems analyst put together after interviewing people who work at the library, okay? So you already have those notes. Uh, sometimes uh, systems analysts, uh, they use uh, not just simple informal interviews, but they use like a formal approach to data gathering. One of them is joint requirements planning sessions or JRP. Okay? Now JRP is, is a somewhat complex methodology. There are a lot of things that go into that, but at the most basic level, it's a group interview, okay? So instead of interviewing users one-on-one, -on -one, systems analysts would invite all of those users together. And in addition to inviting uh, potential users of the system, they would also invite technical specialists, database designers, uh, IT support people, and, and so, so that you have a technology perspective as well. And then they will ask people to answer those questions as a group. Like, for example, okay, tell me about uh, your data needs. Like, what kind of uh, uh, 
what kind of things you're storing data about in your work, right? So people will answer those questions and uh, all those uh, answers will be captured in the form of notes and then analyzed using the same fashion I just described previously. Uh, one, obvious, uh, one obvious advantage of those group interviews called JRP sessions or individual interviews is what? What would you say is an advantage? So why would a systems analyst interview people as a group as opposed to interviewing users individually? What's the advantage? Go ahead, please. Okay, so it could stimulate thinking or creativity in relation to requirements, right? Uh, also, you can have some kind of consensus, right? Because people may have different opinions, different needs. And when they voice those uh, ideas in front of the group, they can talk through those, you know, they can discuss those opinions and come up with a mutual, mutual, uh, mutual consensus as to what the requirements are, right? So that's, that's another advantage. What else? in a way it can be harmful because uh, obviously when you're in a group, sometimes they follow each other mm -hmm. rather than speaking of their own opinion. If they see a generalization, they'll just go along with whatever. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so yeah, I think they call it group thing, right? So that's the disadvantage of group interviews. Sometimes people are influenced by, by groups, right? To the point when, when they don't speak because they're afraid that the group will somehow punish them for voicing their opinion, right? Yeah, that's a disadvantage of group interviews. That reminds me, I was once a member of a task force and the situation was interesting. There were three people with me in that group. Well, there were like five or six people in the group, but three people were from the UAE army. So they were army people. But because they wore like the civilian clothing, I couldn't, I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't really understand who they are. I mean, I knew they're from the army, but I didn't know their ranks, like where, where they, their station and things like that. And then I realized that we have like a, we have a very strange uh, uh, team working pattern where uh, out of those three people, two do not talk, right? And then after a while, I figure out what the arrangement is. One of those people is a general, so he has this high military rank, right? And the other two, they are, they are his subordinates, right? So they, they basically, what happened, you know, what happened, that, that's the kind of pattern I observed. After general says something, they stop discussing. So in their minds, like the general says the final word, right? Something like that. So it took me a while to figure out who is who, like who, who, who has which rank, because again, they kind of look like normal people. They, they didn't wear any military clothing, but that's kind of, I thought like, well, why, why did we call this group meeting where everybody is intimidated by the general, right? This general kind of makes everybody shut up once he says something, right? So, uh, and, I, and, I, and I also realized that he was irritated with me because like he didn't want me to talk like once he says like what the, what the solution is or something like that, right? Uh, so it took me a while to figure out, but yeah, that's, that's the negative group dynamics. Also, if we're talking about advantages, I think GRP sessions can save time. Interviewing people individually can take a lot of time. By the way, something that happened to me today, I had a, uh, one interview lasting 15 minutes in the morning at 11 a.m., right? And that kind of consume, I mean, you would, you would say, you would think it's like 15 minutes, but that kind of consumed my entire morning, right? Because I had to prepare for this interview. Then after, based on the outcomes of that interview, I had to do something, you know, I had to make some arrangements. And the next thing I know, the morning is gone, right? So it's not 15 minutes, more like two or three hours time consumption to interview one person. Okay, now what if you have to interview like 20 people, right? So maybe it's more time efficient to do it in a group. Uh, some systems analysts, they, they formulate, uh, uh, they, they list entities not based on interviews, which, which means primary data, right? Them researching what needs to be done, but they look at secondary data sources such as existing forms, you know, I'm talking about like application forms, files and reports. So from those, uh, sometimes, sometimes they're in the form of an interface to an application, Sometimes they're in the form of like physical records, like paper records. So they will look through those paper records and say, okay, this is what you, you need to store information about, right? So sometimes it's done through secondary data sources. Also, there are the so-called case tools that can reverse engineer existing files and databases. I haven't used any of those tools personally, right? But it's something along the lines of text mining, okay? So what happens, uh, you feed a bunch of documents to those tools and they discover certain topics, right? Together with their attributes to suggest what kind of entities and attributes you need to have in your ERD diagram. So I think that they're, they're largely based on text mining algorithm discover, discovering common patterns in those uh, text or documents, okay? 
So those are the, 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 the most common approaches towards discovering entities. In your case, when it comes to working on assignment three, you don't have to worry about it because uh, uh, all, all uh, well, partially you don't have to worry about it because the nodes are already there. I gave you the file that contains all the nodes that you need uh, for creating your ERD model, okay? And those are the examples. Like this is just like a context data model. That's what you start with. So you have entities and you sketch out relationships. Cardinalities may not be precise. You're just trying to create a sketch. After you add primary and foreign keys, that's your key-based data model. And the key-based data model will allow you to fine tune your cardinalities because now you have primary and foreign keys. And this is your final result, the full attributed data model, a model that has all the, uh, all the entities and all the attributes listed in those entities. Uh, by the way, in relation to assignment three, people are asking like how many attributes is enough? Uh, and I, I, like in a way, I don't want to answer that question because it depends, right? It, it depends on, 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 the, on, on the scenario, right? So I cannot say, oh, you need to have, you know, I don't know, six or seven attributes, right? Uh, but generally speaking, give people this rule of thumb. I, I understand that you cannot capture every relevant attribute because otherwise your model will be huge, right? So maybe like at least five, five attributes per, per entity, that, that's how, how many you need, right? So that's kind of rule of thumb. Or maybe I should say around five attributes per entity. Okay, so so this is uh, this is it. This is how you approach uh, creating an ERD diagram, and uh, we'll uh, switch to assignment three in a second. Before we do that, let me talk about our plans for Thursday. Uh, I'm sorry for next week. Okay, so this is what I have. And feel free to 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 tell me your thoughts, like in case something doesn't seem to be like where, uh, a good idea. Maybe you, you you know a better way of organizing all those things. Okay, so let me know. I'll, I'd appreciate it. So look, this is what you need to do for next week. You need to take exam one, which covers everything that we uh, that we uh, that we covered uh, since the first day of the semester. So all the modules that come before uh, are covered in exam one. Uh, if uh, in order for you to, if you want to know which specific topics will be covered by exam one, you know here I created a study guide. Okay, uh, the exam will be closed book, so you, you cannot use any material. So you will take you will take this exam on your own. There are some security features. It will feature multiple choice, true, false questions covering both theoretical and practical matters that we have covered so far. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah, so it will feature multiple choice, uh, true, false questions, similar to what you what you saw uh, during quizzes when you took when you took quizzes for respective modules. The format of the questions will be quite similar. How do you prepare for the exam? Well, review all the materials. You know that includes our notes, our presentations, our video lectures. Uh, today, I will try to make sure that all of my lectures, including this one, are properly uploaded to YouTube channel. If you want to revisit them again, I would like to remind you that we have another playlist which contains the same series of lectures, but in the more focused fashion. They're not Zoom lectures, they are the lectures that are recorded on my own home computer, okay? So use those and then use this key concept section to, to review for the exam. So all those concepts or most of those concepts will be touched by the exam, right? Of course, not every detail because otherwise we'll have a huge exam, but uh, you can think of, of it this way. I will randomly select which specific concepts will be covered by the exam. So you need to know all of those concepts to do well on the exam. So remember, we started this class by talking about decision support systems. The first subtopic was cognitive biases. We talked about all of them right here. We talked about information requirements by management level. Uh, we talked about uh, approaches to decision-making, uh, types of knowledge. Then we talked about business intelligence. So remember, we discussed all those uh, elements or parts of business intelligence architecture. Um, then we are, we are wrapping up this other big topic, which is database design. So we talked about ERD modeling, entities, attributes, keys, relationships, associated entities, parent entities. Uh, last time we talked about normalization, right? And today we, uh, we finished this, we wrapped up this topic by covering stages in ERD model development, okay? 
So now you have everything that you need uh, to take exam one, okay? Now, how do I see it happening? Uh, this, this is what I came up so far. And, and, and right before class, I kind of changed my mind a little bit with respect to dates. Now tell me if it's a good idea or bad idea. At first, I wanted to make this exam due on Wednesday. And by Wednesday, we mean uh, March 3rd. So instead of having a lecture, you will take the exam. That's the idea that I, that I had. But then I thought, well, maybe I should extend the deadline until Saturday. Do you think it will be helpful for you if I extend the deadline until Saturday in case you want to study more for this exam? You see, my, my struggle is this. In a way, it doesn't matter for me when the deadline is, but I don't want people to put everything until the end. You see what I'm saying? So what do you think? Is it like fair deal if, if, if the deadline is Saturday, not Wednesday? Or you think it will make you kind of drift away and put everything off? Okay. 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 So let's do it Saturday again. If you're put, if you're one of those people who who is putting everything until the last day, then I guess it's you who to blame, right? In the past, I had students blaming me for having deadlines on Sunday. They were saying like you 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 ruin our weekends by forcing us to do things on Sunday. So. Uh, and, and I guess on purpose, I kind of decided, well, maybe I'll force people to complete everything before Sunday or something like that. Well, anyways, if Sunday is important for you, then do it by, uh, by Saturday or do it even early, early in the week, right? So, okay, I'll go ahead and I'll change the deadline. Now, there's one thing I didn't do. Taking this exam will require lockdown browser and a working webcam. Have you done this before? Is there anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about? So I, you, yeah, go ahead, please. I, I haven't used the webcam before. Is it just you like Zoom? You just turn it on and. Well, the most important thing is that you have a working web camera, a camera that's connected to the internet and it's working. Is your web camera working okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess with, with Zoom, everybody has a working web camera. So you shouldn't worry about it. What's going to happen is that uh, when you try to take this exam, it will ask you to, uh, uh, first of all, to make sure that you have your camera on, it's working, it's connected. And then it will ask you to go through certain security procedures. Uh, for example, uh, it will ask you to show your surrounding. Like, for example, you will take your laptop and kind of move it around to show what's around you, right? Uh, also, when you take the exam, it will, you know, you, you need to keep your camera off, uh, on, I'm sorry, not off, on. So what's gonna happen if your face disappears from the screen, the system will flag your, video, your, your exam video, right? And then it will send me a message saying something suspicious happened during exam. This is to make sure that people take exam without any notes and there's nobody in the room helping them, okay? It will ask you to show your ID into the camera. Any ID will, will do, like your student ID, you don't have to show your driver's license. Uh, it will ask you to show around you to show your surrounding and things like that. And then after that, again, you'll be taking exam while the camera is filming you. Um, friends, this is for like for anti cheating protection. You know, it, it creates some degree of assurance that uh, people are not cheating when they take those exams. Personally, I don't do anything with those videos. I don't, I don't uh, like, I don't publish them anywhere. I don't do anything. I use it for security monitoring. And on, honestly, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to watch like 10 hours of exam videos to make sure nobody's cheating, right? Uh, what I'm doing, I'm only, I may only look at your video if the system uh, reports something suspicious, right? So for example, if there's any kind of uh, un unusual thing going on, it will send me a notification about that. And I, will, I may look at your video then, right? But other than that, I'm not going to look at you like what you're doing there and things like that, okay? Um, so, so that's what it is. If you have a working web camera, it shouldn't be an issue. It should all work out. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, the assumption here is that people are not cheating. I know generally they're not, but sometimes like when, when the, when the uh, security procedures are too loose, you may have like one or two people doing something. So yeah, don't worry about it. I mean, if something happens on a technical level, we'll try to resolve it. But so far, I mean, I haven't had any complaints about like technical glitches, right? The only complaint I had from people is that they didn't have a web camera or something like that. But I guess nowadays because of Zoom, everybody has a working web camera, right? 
Does this address your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, and, and then let, don't, don't get stressed out. Just don't wait until the last moment to take the exam, right? So let me know if something is not working, we'll try to figure out. It's not the end of the world if something happens, okay? I do have a, a question or a recommendation at least. Uh, would you be able to create some sort of like dummy assignments that we could test our webcam and make sure that it's working with the software? Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, I used to do it with one of my quizzes. How about that? Uh, we have our business uh, ERD quiz coming up. Yeah, that's a good point. Let me just check one second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people are saying off-campus network sometimes is better. Well, I don't know. For me, it's reliable enough. Rarely have any issues. Hey, how about that? You know, tell me if you disagree with that. To, to, to make you practice, there is a ERD quiz based on the mod module that we, we have just completed. It's due on Monday, March 1st. Okay. I'll change the settings for this quiz where it will also require web camera so you can practice with, with, with stakes being quite low. How about that? Will that work for you? Okay, I'll, I'll do it right away. So I'll change this ERD quiz, which is due March 1st. I'll change the settings so it requires the web camera so you can practice taking it with a web camera, okay? And then based on that, you can let me know if something is bothering you for the actual exam. Okay, good suggestion, thank you. Now, another thing I would like to bring your attention to is the access tutorial. Uh, after, after that week, after the next week, we'll start working on uh, building decision support systems with Microsoft Access. Because of that, I want everybody to get up to speed with Microsoft Access application. What I've noticed over the years is that people are on different levels sometimes. Uh, sometimes I have students who have never seen Microsoft Access for whatever reason, they've never used it, and I can understand that, right? Or sometimes you have people who took classes re related to Microsoft Access. For example, uh, CIS students and, and computer science students, I think when you take 199, right? You deal yeah, in 407, if you're like one of those people who took 407, but you don't use Access in 407, right? You do? Okay, well, that's fine. In that case, you're well equipped for that second stage of our course. Uh, I mean, that second stage will not be, will not really be about like functionality of access. It will be more about answering questions based on data using Microsoft Access, right? So I've noticed people are on different levels. Uh, I, want, I want everybody to get up to speed with Microsoft Access. And for that, you need to watch Microsoft Access tutorial if you are not one of those people who already know Access quite well. If you're one of those people, you still need to watch that tutorial. Maybe uh, you need to speed up the video so you don't spend like two or three hours. But the two parts that I've posted I think combined there are three hours, okay? So it's a great video where a person explaining how to use Microsoft Access. He also has brief exercises or examples you can follow along. You can open Microsoft Access and you can do the same thing that he's doing to get that hands-on understanding of Microsoft Access. Again, I want people to do it at their own pace because again, people have different levels of understanding of Microsoft Access. Maybe some people will skip some parts, some people will spend more time on those parts. So that's why I don't wanna do it in a centralized fashion. I wanna give it, uh, Put it in your hands how to do it, you know, how to view those tutorials. Okay. So, so watch those two parts of Microsoft Access tutorial and take this quiz to show me that you understand the basics of Microsoft Access. Okay. Now, if exam is due on Saturday, right? I'm giving as much time as I can to prepare to prepare for the exam. I will set that access tutorial to be due on Sunday. Because my assumption is that most people will not work on Microsoft Access tutorial unless they're done with exam one. I think that's my assumption, right? So I'll put it for Sunday, uh, for Sunday if you don't mind. Let me change the deadline. Yeah, so it's correct deadline, right? So, so what did you say, March 14th? Yeah, it's already on Sunday, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it's correct. So 
So yeah, exam one is due on Saturday, March 6th, and access tutorial is due on Sunday, March 7th, okay? Now, during normal class, I will be available in Zoom in case you wanna connect and discuss something. For example, if you're preparing for exam one, you can ask questions, or if you have any other questions, you can uh, connect and, and talk to me, right? So it will be like more of one-on-one -on -one work rather than a formal class, okay? So what do you think about this plan? Does it make sense? Yeah, so we have we have two classes next week, Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, attendance of those classes is not required. Uh, I'll be in Zoom during class time in case you want to connect and discuss something in relation to the exam or anything else. Okay. Uh, for you, uh, the deadline to take exam one is Saturday, not Wednesday. I, I told you, sorry, I, I think I made myself uh, unclear. I said that initially I wanted it to be Wednesday, but then people kind of uh, unanimously told me it would be helpful if I extend the deadline by Saturday, right? Until Saturday. So it's up to you. You can take it on Wednesday and then work on Microsoft Access tutorial, or uh, I don't know. You can take it later, like closer to Saturday. My advice to you: don't wait until Saturday midnight to start taking the exam. I mean, that will be too late. That's when people run into all those problems, like oh, my web camera is not working, my internet connection is not working. Because if you try to do it, let's say by Friday, then you have like one day to figure things out before the deadline. Right? Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I just want, yeah, I want to make that clear too. You can take this exam uh, anytime you want. Uh, the earlier, the better, right? So you have more time to work on Microsoft Access tutorial. The exam is available actually now, so you can take it now if you want to. But of course, you need to prepare for it before you take it. Go ahead, please. Yeah, let, let, let me double check everything. But the way all of my quiz, I'll, I'll double check to make sure it's true. But the way my quizzes are set up is that you have answers available two days after the deadline, right? So let me know if this is not true for one of the quizzes. It, it probably means that I forgot to change the setting. But I'll double check right now, too. But can you view it through the lockdown browser? Yeah. Yeah, so viewing quiz answers will require lockdown browser. That's fine. That's fine? Okay. All right, so we, we figured everything out, right, for next week. Um, now, let's switch to assignment three, if you don't mind. Let me open it once again and remind you what we're doing. First of all, we have assignment three case right here. I showed it to you before, okay? Uh, this case comes from your textbook, and I told you that once we go to assignment four, you need to have the textbook for this course, okay? So I gave you some time to get it. Uh, you still have two weeks to get it, a bit less than two weeks, so please do it. Uh, this is the... Uh, let me check some. I made assignment three. Okay. Yeah, I have exam assignment example. I'm sorry, I forgot to unpublish it. But anyways, if you get stuck, I can show you that example a bit later. But first, I want you to 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 to, to try to create uh, this ERD model on your own. Um, now, the assignment itself, I showed you last time the template that you'll use. So first you need to list all the entities based on those nodes. So you'll create one table for every entity and then you list attributes together with their data type types. And then you will create as a part two in, in the second part, you'll create an ERD model, fully attributed normalized uh, ERD model, okay? Uh, make sure there are no, no many to many or non-specific relationships. Please make sure there are proper primary and foreign keys inserted into all those entities. Most likely what will happen is that you'll get, you'll go back and forth between part one and part two. As you develop a better understanding of your ERD model, you may actually modify or create additional entities here in your list, okay? So 
So that's what needs to be done. Uh, let's get started right now or we'll continue working on it. Don't be shy. If you're completely lost, if you don't know what, what we're doing, if you don't know where to start, let me know. So I'll help you get started, right? Uh, feel free to discuss with me any ideas that you have. And as, as I said, I can show you like some of the solutions to your problems if, if you formulate a question that is specific enough, okay? So let, let's start working uh, on assignment three. Uh, let me know if you would like to discuss anything at any point, either face-to-face -face or in Zoom, okay? Uh, no, I'm, like, what I'm doing in this class, I'm kind of simplifying the requirements because I want people to have like an understanding of data modeling, but you don't want to do like too detailed, right? So it's more like a, from this practical purposes, just understanding how databases work rather than mainly open and real. Uh, Yeah, I see. Uh, I think uh, I see what you're saying. Uh, I think it falls under this under this, uh, under this definition of a foreign key, right? However, I'm not requiring you to mark it as a foreign key because I see it's an associated entity, right? And by definition, it has a compound primary key comprised of primary keys of other entities, right? So I feel like it's redundant. So I'm not going to be uh, requiring you to mark them as foreign keys as well. Okay. Um, yeah, Yeah. Okay, I'll show you on the screen and everybody as well, like, like what kind of solution I have for you for like this part. Anything else? Any, any other part that you're not sure of? Yeah, so you resolve the, uh, yeah, that's all. Yeah, so it's good, looks good. Yeah, table one, you both care this. Yeah, you need, I keep changing it because like every time I teach this course, something changes with those web tools. So I told everybody to use draw IO. So if you're using Glue, it means you haven't been attending all oh, actually. I'm very last I'm gonna like that well. You can also use Glyphy, but right now I think they don't have the free version anymore, right? So and, and I told people like they can use any tool they want, like anything they're comfortable with, as long as I can understand the diagram. Okay, I'm back to Zoom. I, I want to show you something. Just one second, please.
Uh, friends, there's this part of assignment three that seems to uh, generate a lot of questions. Um, uh, by the way, this is not the only way to do it, right? Maybe it's not the best way to do it, but this is how I resolve the situation. There was something in those notes about employees and keeping track of their uh, clocking, of them clocking in and clocking out from work, something like that, right? Uh, there is also something uh, discussed in those notes about uh, keeping track of how those employees are compensated, whether they're salaried employees or not. Okay, so this is how I approach that problem. For employee entity, I have this this uh, boolean or yes or no or true false attribute: employee salaried, yes or no, right? I'm assuming that if somebody says yes, then the next variable, which is employee pay rate, is annual salary. If the person answers no, then this next variable employee pay rate is hourly pay. In any case, you can calculate how much you owe uh, to employees uh, salary wise based on those two attributes. So I feel like uh, these two attributes, they take care of the situation. The other thing, uh, the, the other problem of uh, keeping track of when employees come in uh, to work and when they leave, I created a, an entity called check uh, clock in, right? So this is my assumption. This clocking entity has clocking ID as the primary key. Every time an employee uh, scans his or her card, there is an entry created here. So we capture clocking date and clocking time and when, when that employee and which employee did that transaction, okay? Uh, my assumption here is that that's enough to keep track of people coming in and, and coming up. For example, the assumption here that the first card swipe is clocked in. So you don't need to mark it as a clock in, right? Because you know, because it's uh, it's odd number, it's it's coming in. If it's an even uh, even transaction, like transaction number two, let's say, it means that's clock out, right? If you see a transaction number five, it means clock in. Employee came to work, right? So collectively, I feel like these two entities they take care of that. Again, maybe that's not the only way to do it. Maybe a better idea to organize your data, but that's how I did it. That's how I suggest you do it. Okay. The other two things I would like to bring your attention to is this. You have interest and you have members. Now one member can have many interests in terms of book categories and one interest of book category can have many members associated with it. With it. So because it's a many to many relationship, you resolve it by creating an associative entity in between. In my case, I call it member interest. Okay, and the same thing, the same problem you will see in the relationship between books and authors. One book can have many authors, one author can have many books. It's a many-to-many -many relationship. You need to resolve it with the help of a book authorship associative entity. By the way, when you create an associative entity, it will have by definition a compound primary key. You don't have to mark those parts as foreign keys. I understand that those uh, primary keys, those components of the primary key come from different entities. So you don't have to mark them as foreign keys, okay? Okay, so, so keep working, please. I'll take attendance now. Let me know if you get stuck. I'll show you like how I, I approach like some of those uh, issues in my ERD diagram. I think it was actually one of the students' diagrams, but I worked on it a little bit. I improved it a little bit. Okay, Clifton. Here. You, Braden. Nathan. Devante. Here. Aaron David. Aaron David. I'm here. Thank you. Jessica. I'm here. Hope. Here. Sean. Here. Harrison. Here. Tristan. Violet, Violet not here, 
Mason? Ahmed? Wesley? I'm here. Aaron Haney? Not here. Tucker? Here. Janice? Here. Jacob? Here. Caitlin? Caitlin? Jason Reynolds? Here. Brendan? Brandon, not here. Casey. I'm here. Thank you. Okay, so keep working, please. Let me know if you would like to discuss something. Also, don't be shy. Let me know if you get stuck. You don't know how to start with something. I'll show you like how you can start. Say it again, please. Yeah. Yeah, you're free to go if you're done with assignment three. Maybe start studying for exam one today or something. I, I have a question actually about um, attributes actually. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if the attributes are supposed to uh, kind of share the entity name. Like for example, let's say you have like a member table and you have like an employee table mm -hmm. you're gonna have name listed on both of those so if i just call it name is it fine or do i need to say like member name or and then employee name uh this is the naming convention that i'm using like when a name attributes the first word is always the name of the entity and i hope you see why right because you may have name in employee you may have name in in the in the library card entity you may have name in the uh, library member entity right so when you look at this attribute, you cannot understand immediately what kind of name you're talking about, the name of the library member, employee, or the name on the card. So that's what I recommend. Although uh, I've seen many people, uh, I see uh, a lot of people not doing that. So that's my convention. I, I highly recommend that you use it, but I don't, uh, I guess I'm not requiring it. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. I'm sorry, say which which lab, which uh, entity again? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of those things that are kind of uh, up to uh, your interpretation. I would call it employee, right? Because to me, librarian is somebody who actually works with books, right? But you can have other employees at the library. They're not necessarily librarians, right? Maybe, I don't know, cleaning technicians or something like that. So, so that's why I think employee is a better name than librarian. Tucker, are you in the Curry Center? Yeah. Well, you should have come here. I mean, if you're going to university anyway, you could have come to the left. Um, yeah, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's better there because they have access to Starbucks and food.
Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think it's like uh, uh, we include the public interest like it looks like that. Uh, is it mentioned in the case? I mean, is it discussed in the case? I mean, it seems like a good idea, right? I'm just saying that you don't need to include everything that you can think about the book, right? As long as you have like around five attributes, that should be fine. But if it's mentioned in the case, then you need to include it. Let me just see what I included for books. I guess I included publisher as well. Yeah. No, actually, I didn't. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's, it's a good idea to include something like that, but you don't have to include everything that's related to a book. Otherwise, you, your model will be huge, right? That's what I did. I added ISBN 10, and that should take care of publishers as well, because you can always look up by that ISBN number. You can see like what's the title, or who is the publisher, and things like that. So, It's a subject, basically. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. One person has many categories of interest. So, if, like, for example, the, uh, the botany in France, it can't do the same interest of botany in the French study of botany. And so, with greater strength. So it's like a book category, book, book topic sometimes. And the reason they need it because they want to classify books and also they want to inform members if a new book within their interest arrives. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, that will eliminate part of the confusion. If you're joining us in Zoom, I would like to show you what we've been talking about. We've been talking about uh, classifying books according to interest, which means like a topic like sci-fi, uh, I don't know, business book, things like that. And then members, they're also related to those interests because we want to know which books a particular member is interested in. Now, in accordance with the case, with your notes, is that one book can, can only be classified into one category or one interest category. While one interest category obviously can have many books. While members can have many interests and interests can have many members. So it's a many-to-many -many relationship. We need to resolve it like this with an associated entity called member interest.
I've got another question actually. Yes. Uh, in the uh, the practice uh, database design problem, it describes uh, a mail being stored. Is that would that be considered an email? Or would that just be an address? Of of which uh, entity? Oh, uh, of the member. I'm sorry. Uh, Oh uh, yeah, it's probably uh, just one second. Probably email, yeah. Okay. Because uh, I, I need to look at the case again, but I think in the case they do they do talk they do mention email and mailing address because they want to mail something to those members, right? Yes. So I guess you need to have both. You need to have email and you need to have mailing address. Okay. Thank you. And here the simplifying assumption is that uh, you know member address is like a one string. It's not like a you know it's a compound attribute. So I think strictly speaking, you need to add all those parts like you know a street number, a street name, a town, state, zip code, right? Would we need to break down the number and the street name though? Um, so if we... I mean, if you're be I think if you're building a real database, uh, you know. In, in accordance uh, with the first normal form, yes, but I've seen people doing it as as as, a, as one string, like as one attribute called street address. What? Yeah, yeah. I've not like I've seen some database developers uh, doing something like that. What uh, Tristan is suggesting, uh, what they do, they create a separate entity called address. And then there's like a one-to-one -one relationship between members and addresses. Now, in a way, there is no such need. There is no need to create a separate entity for somebody's address because you can assume that the address is entered into, in, into the member's entity. However, even if, if this assumption is correct, um, some database designers, they like to separate entities because address is an entity different from the member, so they create a separate entity. And also another assumption, you know, uh, like a different assumption could be that a member can change his or her address. So in that case, one member can have many addresses, right? So that's another way to go. You can create a separate entity called address. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. No, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good point. And actually, I've seen people doing it. I've seen uh, people creating like an entity just to uh, not to overload the main entity with a lot of attributes. Yeah. Well, structure usually means it's better. Having structure is better than not having structure. But of course, you cannot take it too far and have like a very highly structured database that is too complex to understand. I think for this specific case, it's probably not necessary because there's only one library. Because there's only one library, you don't need to create a table for it, right? However, if you're talking about a library with multiple locations, which is not the case for, for us, right, then you may have an entity called library, right? 
So I guess the whole thing, your entire ERT diagram is your library. So, the, but, but it comes down to this. If you have only one entry, one row, then there is no point for creating a table unless you anticipate that there'll be other entries there in the future. I've got another question again. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, so for an attribute that's made of other attributes, like a compound one, like member name, mm -hmm. uh, would we just simply say for the data type that it's compound? Or would we like- I, I would just list data types for those uh, parts of the compound attribute. Okay. So maybe me member name will not, will not have a data type because it can have uh, uh, sub attributes of different data types. So that's how I would do it. So would we leave that field blank on the on the table or would or, or what? You what can you leave it to... blank or as you said, maybe mention it's a compound attribute. Just put compound. Okay. 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 Uh, well, here I'm just using author ID as an attribute, right? Okay. How exactly it works in real life, to be honest, I don't know because I'm not a librarian, right? Maybe in the library. Uh, I do know that, no, I mean, actually, I take it back. I, I do know that nowadays for authors, and by authors, I mean researchers, people who publish papers, they give you that universal code. And I forgot the acronym, but it's something like OEI, something like that. Yeah, yeah, something like that. They give you this code, and then this code is associated with all of your papers publication. I think they, they started using it for book authors as well. So I guess what it, it comes down to this, we're using some sort of an identifier code to uniquely identify each author, because indeed there are so many authors with the same name. For example, I was a bit shocked. You know Leo Tolstoy, that famous Russian author? Well, uh, I once looked at the library, there are like 12 authors there whose name is Leo Tolstoy, right? So, no, actually there were like 12 members that, that had last name Tolstoy and out of those 12 members, two or three had Leo Tolstoy as their name. Yeah, that's what I have. I have author ID as the primary key and then author name, which is broken down into first name, middle initial and last name. No, the, you cannot have author as an attribute in a book entry. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, because that would violate uh, first normal form because sometimes you have more than one author associated with the book. Some books are written by several people like textbooks, right? Yeah, because it's not allowed to have more than one. You cannot have like a list of values within one attribute in the database. Yeah, associative entity. Right. Um, well, right here, you see it on the screen, right? 
So one book can be written by many authors while one author can write many books. So I created an associative entity here called book authorship that links transactions. Like you know, when, when one author authors a book, we create an entry here. So for example, if there is a book with three authors, then we'll have three entries in that book authorship linking three authors to the same book. All right, have a good weekend. See you later. Jessica, are you okay? Do you have any questions? Um, yeah, for the uh, librarian, that would be connected to the employee, right? Because they work there. Um, You're talking about employee and what else? What librarian? Uh, let me show you like how uh, how we did it here. Just one second. So to keep track of employees, and that includes librarians, we, we created a labor uh, uh, an entity called employee. Okay. Oh, okay. 
And then uh, we have an entity called clock in to monitor employee attendance. So whenever an employee uh, scans his or her card, then a clock in uh, entry with a date and time is created. We don't distinguish between clock in and clock out because it's uh, we can deduct it from the data. For example, a uh, transaction uh, that has an odd number, it's always clock in because you know first you need to come to work, right? The one that has even number is clock out. Mm -hmm. That's the assumption here. Now we didn't really connect, uh, you know, somebody mentioned like which name to use. I used employee. If you call this entity librarian, that's not a, an error. My reasoning here is that a library has many employees, not just librarians. Right. Okay. Yeah, I may be wrong in my understanding of how libraries work, but my understanding is that a librarian is somebody who works in, in you know, with books and with customers. While you may also have, let's say, somebody who is a cleaner or something like that, right? Right. So that's okay. why I call it employee. And then it's not really linked to anything, although maybe you can uh, link employees to book checkouts, like which employee helped to check out a book. Oh, all right. Maybe, uh, although it wasn't, it wasn't specified in the case that you need to keep track of which librarian or which employee checked out a particular book to a library member. Okay, all right. That's that's all. <laughs> you see it on the screen because I'm showing you like how it looks like. Oh yes, yes. Okay, okay good. Okay, thank you. That's that's all yeah. I have. Oh, well, Jason left. Come in. Okay. Okay, I was actually going to your office, but we can do it right here. I'm done. I'm okay. Okay. Okay, guys, I'll, I'll okay, connect because I have somebody from IT here, okay? Guys, see you. S send me an email if you have any questions, but preferably with your